I've always had a knack for stumbling into situations that most would steer clear of. Call it curiosity or sheer foolishness. It's gotten me into more scrapes than I'd care to admit. But then again, it's what makes me a half-decent journalist, if I say so myself. I'm the guy who doesn't just pass by the abandoned house on the edge of town. I'm the one who goes in, camera in hand, ready for whatever ghost story or urban legend is waiting to be uncovered. So when an envelope slid across my desk with nothing but the words Crimson Moon scrawled on it, you bet it caught my attention. It was crumpled, as if it had been carried around in someone's pocket for days before they mustered the courage to send it my way. I remember picking it up, turning it over in my hands, feeling the weight of whatever story it carried. Inside was a single piece of paper folded haphazardly, the words written in a hurried, almost frantic scrawl. They're not what they seem, it read. Look into the crimson moon. That was it. No name, no explanation. Nothing to indicate who had sent it or why. At first glance, it seemed like the kind of thing you'd dismiss outright. But there was something about the urgency of the note. The way Crimson Moon was underlined twice that piqued my curiosity. It wasn't just the name that caught my attention. It was the desperation behind it. The silent plea for someone to dig deeper. I'll admit, the term Crimson Moon was unfamiliar to me at that moment. But as I sat there, turning the note over in my hands, I realized this wasn't just some random phrase. It was a name, a moniker, for something much larger and potentially more sinister than I could have imagined. It was only after I hit the search engines, typing in Crimson Moon with a mix of skepticism and intrigue, that I began to understand the gravity of what I'd stumbled upon. Forums and obscure websites painted a picture of a group shrouded in mystery, a cult-like organization that had managed to stay under the radar, whispers of their activities surfacing only in the most hidden corners of the internet. The more I read, the more the pieces began to fall into place. This wasn't just a story. It was a labyrinth of secrets, and the note was my invitation to step inside. I remember leaning back in my chair, the glow of the screen casting long shadows across the room, thinking this might just be another dead end. But there's a part of me, you see, that thrives on the chase, on piecing together the fragments of a story that doesn't want to be told. That's when I decided I wasn't just going to write about the Crimson Moon. I was going to infiltrate it, get the story from the inside. Looking back, I can't help but laugh at the audacity of it all. An average Joe like me, thinking he could just waltz into a cult, if that's what it was, and come out with a story to tell. But that's the thing about curiosity. Once it's got its hooks in you, there's no turning back. So I set out with little more than a lead and a misguided sense of invincibility, ready to peel back layers of this mystery. The path I was about to walk would take me to places darker than I'd ever imagined, to the very edge of sanity and beyond, but that tale will come later. For now, let's just say that this is where it all began, with a name, a cult, and a journalist foolish enough to think he could uncover the truth. The deeper I dug, the more I uncovered about the Crimson Moon. It wasn't just a name. It was a shadow that loomed over forgotten stories and unsolved mysteries. The first thread I pulled on led me to a series of missing persons cases, each one chillingly similar, people from different walks of life, with nothing in common except for their abrupt disappearance, and a single cryptic clue left behind. In each case, somewhere among their belongings or in their last known locations, the symbol of a crimson moon was found, 
a silent marker that became the only link between them. As I pieced together these stories, a pattern began to emerge. These weren't random disappearances. They were orchestrated, each person chosen with a purpose that remained frustratingly out of reach. The police reports were a dead end, chalked up to lack of evidence. Or in some cases, an unwillingness to delve too deeply into what was quickly becoming an unsettling mystery. But it was the tales of their strange ceremonies that truly sent shivers down my spine. Witnesses, few and far between, spoke of gatherings in the dead of night, where figures robed in crimson would convene under the light of a blood-red moon. They spoke in hushed tones, their words tinged with fear of rituals that defied explanation. Where chants in an unknown language would fill the air, echoing through the woods where these gatherings were rumored to take place. And at the center of it all was a figure known only as the Crimson Oracle. Descriptions varied, shrouded in the shadows of secrecy and fear. But one thing remained consistent. This was the leader, the guiding hand behind the Crimson Moon. The Oracle was a figure of intense fascination and terror. A person, or perhaps something more, whose motives were as inscrutable as their identity. I remember sitting in the dim light of my room, surrounded by notes and clippings, feeling the weight of the unknown pressing in. There was something here, something dark and twisted that went beyond mere curiosity. The Crimson Moon was a puzzle, and the Oracle the missing piece that held it all together. But with every piece of information I uncovered, more questions arose. What was the purpose of their rituals? Why were these people chosen? And most importantly, what happened to them after they disappeared? The answers were out there, hidden in the whispers and shadows, and I knew I couldn't turn back. I had to find the truth, no matter how disturbing it might be. The journey from curiosity to standing at the threshold of the Crimson Moon's hidden sanctuary was a blur of reckless decisions and second guesses. Posing as a seeker, someone disillusioned by the world and searching for meaning, seemed like my best bet to gain their trust. It was a role I slipped into with an unsettling ease, donning a mask that felt uncomfortably fitting as I delved deeper into their world. My initial contact was through a seemingly innocuous forum, a digital labyrinth of spiritual seekers, conspiracy theorists, and the lost souls of the internet. Buried within was the gateway to the Crimson Moon, a subtle invitation to those who knew how to look. Crafting my persona, I reached out expressing a vague dissatisfaction with the world and a longing for something more, something transcendent. The response was almost immediate, a welcoming message that was warm and eerily personal. They spoke of understanding and community, of a place where the disillusion could find purpose. It was all very benign, a stark contrast to the whispers of darkness I had been chasing. I was invited to a gathering, a term that seemed deliberately mundane, designed to disarm and reassure. I remember the mix of fear and adrenaline as I approached the location given, a nondescript building tucked away in an overlooked part of town, the kind of place you'd never give a second glance, which I suppose was the point. As I stepped inside, the atmosphere was unexpectedly inviting, the air filled with the scent of incense and the low hum of conversation. The people I met were nothing like the shadowy figures I'd imagined. They were ordinary, faces you'd pass on the street without a thought. They greeted me with smiles, eager to share their stories of how the Crimson Moon had given them a sense of belonging a family bound not by blood, but by shared enlightenment. It was also normal, 
a community gathering that felt more like a support group than a cult. Even the practices they shared that evening were harmless on the surface. Meditation, discussions on philosophy and the power of the mind, exercises in trust and emotional openness. There was a sense of peace in the room, a collective warmth that was infectious. I found myself drawn in, the part of me playing the role of a seeker beginning to blur with the reality of my own search for meaning. But beneath the camaraderie and spiritual platitudes, there were undercurrents of something more. Subtle glances, whispered conversations that ceased when I drew near. The faintest hints of an inner circle to which access was not so freely given. It was clear that what I was seeing was only the surface, a carefully curated facade designed to draw in the curious and the vulnerable. As the evening drew a close, I was left with more questions than answers. The benign exterior of the crimson moon was at odds with the darkness I'd sensed lurking beneath. But one thing was clear, this was only the beginning the first step into a world that straddled the line between light and shadow. I knew I had to go deeper to see beyond the mask and cover the truth hidden in the heart of the Crimson Moon. The more I mingled among the members of the Crimson Moon, the more the line between my disguise and my true self began to blur. Each gathering peeled back another layer, revealing glimpses of the darkness. I had sensed from the start. It wasn't long before I was invited to a more secluded meeting, a special gathering for those who had shown true dedication. It was the break I had been waiting for, a chance to see what lay beneath the surface. The location was remote, a forgotten stretch of woodland that clung to the edges of reality like a dark secret. The journey there was a silent pilgrimage, a procession of cars winding through the night, headlights cutting through the fog like a procession of fireflies. I remember the tightness in my chest, a mix of anticipation and dread as the trees closed in around us. We were led to a clearing, the moon overhead a thin crescent, barely enough to illuminate the assembled figures they stood in a circle, their robes no longer the innocuous white I had seen at the earlier meetings, but a deep blood red that seemed to drink in the moonlight. The air was charged, a palpable tension that made every whispered chant and every flickering shadow feel like a prelude to something unthinkable. The ritual began with the oracle stepping into the center of the circle their presence commanding an immediate silence. There was something about them, an aura of power that was both captivating and terrifying. They spoke in a language I couldn't understand, their voice a melody that twisted in the air, weaving through the assembled members who responded in kind. As the ritual progressed, the benign practices I had witnessed before were replaced by something far more primal, Offerings were made, symbols drawn in the earth, and the air filled with the scent of burning herbs and something else. Something metallic that set my nerves on itch. The oracle moved with a grace that was almost inhuman, their hands tracing patterns in the air that seemed to shimmer with an unseen light. I was pulled forward, a chosen participant, my heart racing as I stepped into the circle the eyes of the assembled members bore into me, a weight of expectation that felt like a physical force. The oracle's hands were cold as they brushed against my forehead, marking me with symbols that burned against my skin. The ritual reached its crescendo, the chants growing louder, more insistent. The boundary between observer and participant vanished, swept away in the tide of the ceremony, I could feel something shifting in the air, a crackle of energy that danced across my skin, whispering of doors being opened to realms beyond our understanding. 
and then, as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. The tension broke like a fever, leaving us standing in the moonlit clearing, the echoes of the ritual fading into the night. The members dispersed, a chorus of subdued voices and fleeting glances, leaving me standing there, marked and shaken, with a sense of having crossed a threshold from which there could be no return. The descent into the heart of the crimson moon had begun, and there was no turning back. The rituals, the symbols, the oracle's touch, all of it hinted at a truth far darker than I had imagined. I knew then that the story I was chasing was more than just a tale of a cult. It was a journey into the very essence of fear and fascination that lies at the core of the human experience. As the days bled into each other, my nights became a tapestry of shadowed gatherings and whispered lore, but nothing could have prepared me for the ritual of the blood moon. A ceremony whispered in hushed tones, its approach marked by an air of anticipation that was almost palpable. This was the crescendo of their dark symphony, an event that drew the veil between the seen and the unseen perilously thin. The night of the ritual was unlike any other. The moon hung heavy and bloated in the sky, a deep crimson that seemed to pulse with an otherworldly light. The very air felt charged, vibrating with an energy that set every nerve on edge. We were led not to the familiar clearing, but deeper into the woods, to a place where the trees twisted into grotesque shapes, as if warped by the very forces we were about to invoke. The circle this time was vast, encompassing a clearing that felt carved from the darkness itself. The members' robes were more ornate, adorned with symbols that glowed faintly in the moonlight, casting eerie shadows on their faces. The sense of unease was overwhelming, a tangible dread that settled like a shroud over the assembled congregation. At the heart of the circle stood the oracle, more imposing than ever, their robes alive with shifting patterns that seemed to tell a story of their own. Their voice, when they began the ritual, was a thing of raw power, weaving through the chants of the congregation, binding them together in a tapestry of sound that was both beautiful and terrifying. The ritual was a dance of light and shadow of fire and blood. Offerings were brought forth, their significance clear even to my uninitiated eyes. The air was filled with the scent of incense and something far more primal, a reminder of the thin line between civilization and the ancient rites we were enacting. As the oracle's chants rose to a fever pitch, the congregation's fervor became almost tangible, a thick electric pulse in the air. The ritual's climax approached, heralded by the procession of robed figures emerging from the shadows, each bearing an earthen bowl filled with a dark, viscous liquid. Their approach was methodical, a slow, deliberate dance that matched the cadence of the oracle's incantations. The oracle, standing at the center of the circle, raised their arms. The moon casting their shadow long and twisted across the clearing, they called forth the chosen participants, myself included, to step forward into the inner sanctum of the circle. The ground beneath my feet felt alive, pulsing with an unseen heartbeat as I approached. The bowls were presented to each of us, the contents shimmering darkly in the moonlight. The oracle's voice, now a commanding whisper, instructed us to anoint ourselves with the liquid to mark our flesh in the symbols of the crimson moon. The liquid was warm, thicker than blood, and as it touched my skin, a sharp, metallic scent filled the air, mingling with the incense to create a heady, intoxicating mix. Around us, the congregation began a low, droning chant, a sound that seemed to come from the very earth itself. 
the oracle continued their incantations, now directing the participants to join hands, forming a chain of flesh and blood that encircled the oracle. Then came the moment that would forever be seared into my memory. From the darkness beyond the circle, a figure was led forth, draped in crimson, their head bowed. The tension in the clearing was a palpable thing, a collective holding of breath as the figure was brought to the oracle. With a fluid motion, the oracle drew a blade, the metal glinting ominously in the moonlight. The congregation's chant grew louder, a cacophony that filled the night. The figure beneath the crimson cloth was revealed to be an animal, a goat, its eyes wide with fear. In one swift, practiced movement, the oracle drew the blade across the animal's throat, the blood spilling into a bowl held beneath by an acolyte. The act was met with a crescendo of voices, a release of the pent-up energy that had been building throughout the ritual. The oracle dipped their fingers into the bowl, flicking the blood towards the moon, and then towards us, marking each participant with droplets that felt like fire against my skin. The ritual concluded with a congregation partaking of the blood, a communion of sorts that bound the participants to the crimson moon and to each other in a covenant written in blood and shadow. It was a moment of unity and horror, a crossing of a line from which there could be no return. As the ritual ended and the congregation dispersed, the echoes of the chants seemed to linger in the air, a haunting reminder of the night's proceedings. The ritual of the blood moon was more than just a ceremony. It was an initiation into the deepest mysteries of the crimson moon, a journey into the heart of darkness from which there was no turning back. In the aftermath of the ritual of the blood moon, a palpable shift occurred within the ranks of the crimson moon. Whispers filled the air, a sense of anticipation and dread mingling in equal measure. It was during this time that the oracle's gaze seemed to linger on me, a silent acknowledgement that sent shivers down my spine. Their favor was a double-edged sword, an honor that came with a weight I wasn't sure I was ready to bear. The oracle began to summon me for private audiences, each meeting shrouded in secrecy and ritual. The first time I was called, I was led to a chamber deep within the heart of their sanctuary a place where the air was thick with incense and the walls were adorned with symbols that seemed to pulse with a life of their own. The oracle awaited, their presence more imposing than ever, surrounded by a halo of candles that cast flickering shadows across their features. You have shown great potential, they began, their voice a low murmur that seemed to resonate within my very bones. But potential is nothing without dedication. Are you ready to ascend? The word ascend hung in the air, heavy with implication. I knew enough to understand that this was no simple progression. This was a transformation, a shedding of the old self to embrace the dark mysteries of the crimson moon. The oracle spoke of the ascension as a grand event a moment of rebirth that would see the chosen few rise to a higher state of being. The descriptions were vague, shrouded in allegory and metaphor, but the undercurrent of horror was unmistakable. This was not a journey of the spirit, but a physical, bloody path that demanded sacrifice and pain in equal measure. With each meeting, the oracle revealed more of what this ascension entailed, Rituals that spoke of flaying the flesh to reveal the purity beneath, of consuming the heart's blood to capture the essence of life itself. The imagery was grotesque, a tapestry of gore and suffering that was painted as a necessary passage to transcendence. The congregation's demeanor towards me changed, 
a mix of reverence and envy that isolated me even as it drew me closer to the Oracle's inner circle. I was privy to secrets that few others knew, shown texts and artifacts that spoke of ancient rites and blood packs with entities that dwelled in the shadowed corners of reality. But it was the preparations for the ascension that truly unveiled the depths of the Crimson Moon's depravity. I was taken to a chamber, a sanctum where the air was heavy with the scent of decay. Here, the Chosen were prepared, their bodies subjected to rituals that left them broken and remade, vessels for whatever dark power the Oracle sought to invoke. The horror of what I witnessed was indescribable, a carnage masked as sanctity. The Chosen were flayed, their screams a chorus that echoed through the stone corridors their blood collected in sacred vessels to be used in the final rite. The Oracle presided over these preparations with a cold detachment, a maestro orchestrating a symphony of suffering. As the day of the ascension drew near, the sense of impending doom grew. I knew I had to escape, to bring the truth of the Crimson Moon to light before it was too late but the Oracle's favor was a cage of thorns. Each attempt to distance myself met with veiled threats and chilling reminders of the fate that awaited the Chosen. The Ascension was not just an event. It was a cataclysm in waiting, a ritual that would unleash horrors untold upon the world. And I, marked by the Oracle's favor, was to be both witness and participant in this dark symphony of blood and shadows. As the day of the ascension loomed ever closer, the atmosphere within the cult's enclave became electric, charged with a frenetic energy that bordered on hysteria. The preparations intensified, each member playing their part in a dance that was both macabre and meticulously choreographed. I found myself caught in the eye of the storm, drawn inexorably towards a fate that I could neither escape nor fully comprehend. The rituals became more frequent and more extreme, each one a test of endurance and faith. The Oracle spoke of purification, of shedding our earthly ties to ascend to a higher plane of existence. But the reality was far more visceral a brutal stripping away of flesh and spirit that left scars both seen and unseen. I was marked, chosen for a role that I could not refuse. The Oracle's favor had sealed my fate, binding me to the heart of the Ascension. I was to be both vessel and witness, a living testament to the power of the Crimson Moon. The thought filled me with a dread that was suffocating a realization of the depth of my entanglement in this web of blood and shadows. The final preparations were a grotesque spectacle, a series of rituals that blurred the line between devotion and madness. The Chosen were anointed with sacred oils, their bodies inscribed with symbols that were both ancient and otherworldly. I watched as they were led to the sanctum, their faces a mix of ecstasy and terror, knowing that I would soon join them. The Oracle became more inscrutable, a figure shrouded in mystery and power. Their eyes held a darkness that was unfathomable, a glimpse into the abyss that awaited us all. They spoke of the ascension as a rebirth, a shedding of our mortal coils to embrace the divine, but their words rang hollow, a sinister undertone that belied the true nature of the ritual. As the final night approached, the Enclave was a hive of activity, a frenzy of preparation that felt more like a prelude to a massacre than a spiritual awakening. The air was thick with the scent of incense and blood, a tangible reminder of the horrors that had been wrought in the name of transcendence. I realized then that I was in too deep ensnared in a nightmare that I could not wake from. The truth of the Crimson Moon was a poison that had seeped into my very soul, 
a darkness that I could not escape. But even as I despaired, a part of me clung to the hope that I could still expose the cult for what it was, that I could bring an end to the madness before it was too late. The night before the ascension, I made my decision. I would play my part, bear witness to the culmination of the Oracle's grand design, but I would not go quietly into the night. I would gather every shred of evidence, document every horror, and ensure that the world knew the truth of the Crimson Moon. The preparations were complete, the stage set for a ritual that would either be the cult's ultimate triumph or its undoing. I stood at the precipice, staring into the abyss, knowing that the coming dawn would bring either salvation or damnation. The night air was thick with a palpable sense of foreboding as we gathered in the heart of the forest. The secluded clearing now transformed into a sinister cathedral under the canopy of twisted trees. The moon, a sliver of silver in the ink-black sky, cast an ethereal glow over the assembled congregation, their faces masks of fervent anticipation and dread. The ground had been prepared, inscribed with sprawling symbols that seemed to writhe and shift in the moonlight, a dark mirror to the stars above. At the center stood the oracle, an imposing figure robed in crimson, their face obscured by a mask that was both grotesque and mesmerizing, a visage of a deity or demon conjured from the depths of nightmare. As the ritual commenced, the air was filled with the droning chant of the congregation, a cacophony that seemed to seep into the very earth, awakening something ancient and malevolent. The oracle raised their arms and the clearing was suddenly awash with the light from torches, casting long, dancing shadows that seemed to twist and contort in grotesque parody of the human form. I was led forward, my heart a drumbeat of terror in my chest, my mind reeling at the surreal horror of the spectacle before me. The oracle's gaze pierced through me, a silent command that brooked no refusal. I was to be the vessel, the conduit for whatever dark power they sought to invoke. The chosen were brought forth, a procession of the damned, their bodies marked with the symbols of the ritual, their eyes wide with a mixture of ecstasy and terror. One by one, they were laid upon the altar, their flesh anointed with oils that glistened like blood in the torchlight. The oracle's voice rose above the chant, a litany of ancient words that seemed to twist the very air, warping reality into something other, something dark and pulsing with malevolent life. They approached the first of the chosen, a blade gleaming in their hand, a tool of liberation and damnation. With a precision that spoke of countless such rites, the oracle made the first incision, the blade parting flesh with a sound that was sickeningly wet, a visceral reminder of the mortality that bound us all. The Chosen did not scream. Instead, a rapturous sigh escaped their lips, a sound more chilling than any cry of pain. The blood flowed freely, spilling onto the symbols inscribed on the ground, each drop seeming to ignite the air with a flicker of dark energy. The oracle moved with a grace that was inhuman, their actions not those of a mortal being but a force of nature, an avatar of death and rebirth. As the ritual progressed, the line between observer and participant blurred, the air thick with the coppery scent of blood and the heady incense of the oils. The congregation's chant grew louder, a frenzied crescendo that seemed to shake the very foundations of the earth. The climax of the ritual was a tableau of horror and beauty, a dance of death that promised rebirth into something beyond human understanding. The chosen were transformed, their bodies broken and remade in the image of the oracle's dark vision. 
a testament to the power and horror of the ascension. As the ritual reached its zenith, the clearing was enveloped in a silence that was more terrifying than any scream, a void that awaited the birth of something new, something that had no place in the world of the living. The oracle turned to me, their mask now a visage of inhuman malice, and I knew that the final act was upon us, the moment of my own rebirth or damnation. At the very pinnacle of the ritual, as the air itself seemed to throb with unspeakable power and the ground beneath our feet pulsed with the lifeblood of the Chosen, the unimaginable occurred. The sanctity of our secluded cathedral was shattered by the sudden, jarring blare of sirens, their wails slicing through the night like a clarion call of impending doom. The congregation, so entranced by the ritual's climax, froze as if caught in a spell. The oracle, their moment of triumph so cruelly interrupted, turned their masked visage towards the intrusion, an aura of malevolent fury radiating from their being. Chaos erupted as law enforcement officers, armed and clad in the armor of modern-day paladins, burst through the perimeter. Their shouts, a stark contrast to the droning chants, were commands of surrender, their torchlights cutting through the darkness, banishing shadows and revealing the horror of the ritual in the stark, unforgiving light of reality. The congregation scattered, a flock of dark birds disrupted from their unholy communion. The spell was broken, the connection severed as the cold, hard edge of the law intruded upon the sacred ground. The oracle, their presence once so commanding, now seemed diminished, their power ebbing away as the reality of their situation set in. I found myself caught in the maelstrom, torn between a surge of relief at the intervention and a visceral terror at the realization of how close I had come to an unfathomable fate. My role as a participant, so carefully crafted, crumbled around me, leaving me exposed and vulnerable in the face of the law's unyielding gaze. The Chosen, those who had been prepared for the ultimate sacrifice, lay scattered about the altar, their bodies a testament to the horrors they had endured. The sight was a gruesome tableau, a stark reminder of the thin veil that separates civilization from barbarism. As the officers moved in, their focus turned to the Oracle, the architect of the madness that had unfolded. The cult leader, once a figure of dark majesty, now seemed nothing more than a cornered animal, their power stripped away under the scrutiny of the law. The ritual site was secured, the congregation rounded up, their robes and masks stripped away to reveal the all-too-human faces beneath. The artifacts, the symbols, the tools of the ritual were cataloged and confiscated, evidence of the dark deeds that had transpired. As I was led away, my mind reeled at the rapid turn of events, the surreal shift from the brink of otherworldly transformation to the cold, hard reality of handcuffs and Miranda rights. The haunting realization of what I had been a part of, what I had narrowly escaped, weighed heavily upon me, a burden of knowledge that I would carry for the rest of my days. The intervention of law enforcement had saved me from a fate worse than death, but the scars of that night, both physical and mental, would linger. A constant reminder of the darkness that lies just beyond the veil of the everyday, waiting for those foolish or brave enough to peer into its depths. In the cold light of day, the forest clearing, once a stage for unspeakable rituals, was now a crime scene cordoned off with yellow tape. A stark reminder of the night's horrors, the Crimson Moon cult, with its secrets and shadows, was scattered to the winds. Its members now subjects of interrogation and legal scrutiny. The artifacts, the symbols, the blood-stained altars were cataloged and locked away, evidence of a madness that had almost claimed me. 
the oracle, that enigmatic figure who had presided over the dark rites, was nowhere to be found. In the chaos of the raid, amidst the confusion and fear, they had vanished, a wraith slipping through the fingers of the law. Their fate remained a mystery, fueling rumors and speculation that the heart of the Crimson Moon still beat somewhere in the shadows, biding its time. As I sat in the sterile environment of the police station, my statement taken, my role dissected, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unreality. The questions came at me, a barrage that I could barely process. How had I become so entangled in the cult's web? Where did my role as a journalist end and my indoctrination begin? The lines had blurred, the distinction lost in the labyrinth of my own making. The experience had changed me. The scars it left, not all visible to the eye. Sleep was elusive, the nights filled with echoes of chance and the coppery scent of blood. My reflections in the mirror were those of a stranger, someone who had peered too long into the abyss and now bore its mark. The story I had set out to uncover had consumed me. The truce I had sought lost in a mire of ritual and blood. The cult might have been disbanded, its members scattered, but the shadows it cast were long and dark. The influence of the crimson moon lingered, a stain that no amount of light could erase. The world moved on, the story of the cult becoming a footnote in the endless cycle of news but for those of us who had been touched by the Crimson Moon, the story was far from over. Questions remained, festering in the silence. What had the Oracle sought to achieve with the Ascension? Was it merely the delusion of a madman or something far more sinister, a thread in a larger tapestry we were yet to see? As I tried to piece my life back together to find some semblance of normalcy in the aftermath, I knew that the story wasn't finished. The Crimson Oracle's fate was a loose end, a whisper in the dark that hinted at unfinished business. The cult's teachings, its rituals, had opened doors that were not so easily closed, pathways to darkness that lingered in the periphery of my vision. The aftermath was a liminal space, a threshold between the world I had known and the shadowed realms I had glimpsed through the cult's eyes. I was left with a haunting realization that some stories, once begun, have a life of their own, winding paths that lead to destinations unknown. The crimson moon might have been eclipsed for now, but the darkness it harbored, the questions it posed about faith, power, and the nature of reality remained. The Oracle, a ghost in the narrative, a symbol of the enigmatic forces that drive us towards the abyss, remained a figure of fascination and fear, a reminder that some mysteries are not meant to be solved, only survived. <laughs>